Welcome to the HU Movemakers Podcast, where we highlight folks that are blazing the trail and making moves in Howard culture. Welcome to the HU Movemaker Podcast, where we highlight influential people in Howard culture that are trailblazing and making moves. Today, I have a very, very special guest, an amazing story. This young lady grew up in poverty all the way from another continent, the motherland from Egypt. 2011, America's top dentist for cosmetic dentistry. 2015, America's top dentist, cosmetic dentistry and orthodontics. 2017, it don't stop. 2019, selected by Legacy Magazine as one of the 50 most powerful black leaders in business and industry. One of the youngest folks to graduate from HU's College of Dentistry at the age of 23. Currently the co-owner of Beautiful Smiles. Dentist to the stars. We're talking about D. Wade, LeBron, Amari Stoudemire, Michelle Williams, Gabrielle Union. The list goes on. Uh, check her out on YouTube. Passionate public speaker, mentorship, charity. She's also married to a former Chicago Bear, which is a uh, great Ottawa Leagunye. But today we're talking about Dr. A, as she likes to be called. So, Dr. A, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. What a nice welcome. <laughs> for sure. I, hey. I need you to be like uh, someone in my ear all the time. Hey, yo, you, you, I'm impressed by everything that you've done. And I know that it's not easy to do running a business, having a staff and in the branding. I mean, every time I look on your page on IG and then last <laughs> night I was looking at it on YouTube. I mean, you working out, you balancing family life, you, you uh, talking about being an entrepreneur. I think it's amazing what you got going on. So thank you again for coming on. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So let's get right into it. Um, pull as you climb. That looks like a common theme, you know, when I hear you speak. Uh, and when I, you know, read, read through your bio and see some of the things that you've been able to accomplish. But what does that mean, when, when, uh, pull as you climb? So a couple years ago, I really became passionate about mentorship. And, you know, it's funny how it started because I was at a point in my life where I felt career wise, you know, my, my dental career was, was at a great place. You know, I had this marriage, you know, I had two, you know, beautiful, healthy children. And I, I felt like something was missing. You know, I had conversations with my husband and I, I actually said those words. Like I, something just isn't sitting well. And I, I prayed on it and I was like, you know, how can you have checked off all these boxes in your life and why are you still feeling uneasy? And I realized that I didn't think I was doing enough to pour into other people. Like what was I doing to make an impact on other young individuals who, who look like me, who maybe aspire to do similar things. And so that's when I began the whole philosophy is pull as you climb, you know, you cannot go on through life and, and achieve success and never look back and think I need to help someone. I need to motivate them. I need to encourage them, whether it's a conversation, whether it is um, letting them shadow you. Um, there's so much that we could be doing to really impact our, our youth and our future. And that is why that philosophy has been like so huge to me. None of us got here on our own. That's mm -hmm. just the truth. So. Yeah, so I, I noticed that you do a ton of work in underprivileged communities. Um, now, the, the big shiny thing, of course, is when I look at your page and I'm like, man, D. Wade, I love D. Wade. You know, LeBron, he ain't better than Mike. You know, Michelle, Destiny's Child, like, you know, these, you know, seeing folks like that. But at the same time, you know, you're conscious about, you know, lifting up other people. And like you said, you, you can't do it on your own. Mm -hmm. So... One of the interesting things that I saw is that you're from Egypt, you know, yeah. you're not from uh, America and you nope, grew up born, born in poverty. How did you, how did you get to America? So um, I was born in Egypt and my father came to uh, America when I was two and he came with three children by himself. And my early years, we were very poor. And, um, 
my father, you know, had this American dream and he, he wanted his kids to have a better life. He really instilled education in us uh, to the point of there were no other options, but you have to receive this academic excellence. <laughs> and so I believe that my early years, just seeing how I was brought up in, in experiencing poverty, you, there's a way that you move differently. There's a way you grind differently. And I think that it also is a reflection of wanting to help other people because it doesn't seem so far off to you. You know what those things feel like. You know what it's like to be poor. You know what it's like um, to not have the same advantages as other people. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's part of who I am. It's, it's, it's a huge reason for any success that I have. Well, I would love to talk to your dad. I mean, coming to America, a foreign, a foreign country, and being a single father <laughs> with three little girls. Two, two girls and one boy. Uh, two girls and one boy. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, nonetheless, being a, you know, because I was raised in a single parent household, but it was just me. I couldn't imagine, you know, um, the struggles that your father had to go through. So, yeah. And he, he's, he's just, I always, I give him so much credit. Like a lot of the same things that I complained about, you know, when I was young and how strict he was and how he only accepted excellence. Um, he's a huge part of, of where I'm at today, you know? Wow. So where, where did you guys first move to when you moved to the States? So I grew up in Florida, uh, right outside of Tampa and, um, I was there pretty much my whole, you know, elementary, middle, high school until I went on to, to Howard. Okay. So you went to Howard for undergrad too? Yeah. So I did Howard's um, early dental program, which is called the, the BSDDS. They have a, a med medical portion too. So essentially you can do two years of undergrad. You have to complete all the prereqs, maintain. I, I, at the time I was there, it was a three point eight gpa whoa but yeah you gotta take like 21 oh my god hours. you had to maintain a 3.8 well, at wait, howard with 21 <laughs> credit hours 21 credit hours a semester oh no and then for summer i remember taking like i want to say 16 credit hours because i took physics one and two and organic one and two so and wait, so what year did what year did you come into howard so i graduated high school in 2001 so i was there the that fall Right. But I went on, I only was there two years because I finished everything. So I, I got there in 2001 and I graduated um, dental school in 2007. So it's, cra it's crazy. But you know what's so crazy about life and the story of like how I got to Howard is that my father was, like I said, like so ac academics, academics. And University of Florida in Gainesville, the Gators, they had a program where you could be a dentist in seven years. And he, I applied, I got in, you know, I, he, he found a place for me to live in Gainesville. And I promise you, when we went for the visit, there had to have been like two brown people, period. And I don't even think like one of the brown people might have been like Hispanic, like there was like hardly any black people around. And my dad was just like, I don't care. Like you're going to be a dentist when you're, you're 24 years old. And that's what he kept saying. And two months before school started, we heard Howard had the same program, but six years, which means I would be a dentist even one year earlier. That's crazy. And I, I actually didn't want to go, not because I didn't want to go to Howard. I just was like, that's too fast. I need an undergraduate experience. And my dad was just like, I don't care. I don't care. You're going, you're going. And man, I mean, going to Howard was the best thing that could have ever happen to me. Damn. So was, was dentistry always a passion? No, actually it wasn't. Um, you, and it, again, it's just like, sometimes you just got to trust where life takes you. I, um, my, I come from like a strict African household. So it was, you either be a doctor, a dentist, a lawyer, or really an engineer. Those are your options when you come from this type of culture. And I wanted to be like some sports attorney. And my father was like, sports attorney? Like, no, you're a woman. Like, he was like very, he's like, no, it's, you're going to be a doctor or a dentist. And so I hated hospitals. So I was like, I'm not going to, I hate walking in hospitals. So I'm not going to be a doctor. So I actually went on reluctantly to dental school. Um, and it's just by the grace of God that I love what I do. Wow. That is a crazy story. So, and that's probably why I didn't know you because I was there from 99 to 03 at Howard and I came in a bio major 
thinking that I was going to be a dentist because both my neighbors were dentists. They had went, they went to Meharry. And they were like, oh, when you come out, you're going to be making money, blah, blah, blah. I remember I got to Howard and looked at the scheme. Like, you're going to be taking this class, this class. <laughs> I already know you're going. <laughs> and then I was like walking. I was walking from Drew Hall to, you know, to the Valley. But I'm walking past the School of Business. And I'm like, damn, that, I think I want to, you know, be in there, you know. So then I looked at that scheme and I was like, oh, these class, this look easy. I could do this, you know, two years of math, no science, you know, one science class. So long story short, I just, I was in the, I was a bio major, pre-med or whatever, but uh, I transferred to the school of B and I was out. But, but yeah, you, you, you stuck with it. You had your father, you know, in your ear. So what was it like coming to Howard? Kind of like, you know, like when I got to Howard, it was like, all right, I'm going to just try to maintain a 3.0, you know, like that's how my mom was just like, yo, four years, you know, the, the bar wasn't as high. It was like, yo, you graduated four years, job well done, <laughs> you know? So I'm like, I'm away from home. My mom is not here. I'm going to kick it. I'm going to do me. What was it like for you coming in with, you know, that type of, of pressure, you know, of getting a 3.8? That's, you know, 3.5 is great. 3.8 is really, you know, excellent. You know, I think that sometimes it's like when that's all you know, I, I didn't have much to compare it to. So I was I was in class sometimes from like eight to five, I felt like. Like it was like a full-time job. And that's just what I was used to. Like wow. these were my classes. And I will say that, yeah, my father uh, instilled this level of excellence in me. But by nature, I'm like very competitive. Like at anything, like you can't play taboo with me. It's going to be a fight because like, I'm like, you know, and I think that that competitive drive kind of really helped out even with academics because I felt like I need I need to be at the top. Like this is what I have to do. So somehow I still found the time to get it in and be on, you know, up on the hill, you know, on Fridays, like, you know, um, so I still had a great experience. And even when I went on to dental school, cause I went on to dental school, what would have been my third year of undergrad, but since I left That's early, crazy. <laughs> I left early, my, you know, my dental classmates would, would joke because I was so much younger than them. Like I would be like rushing out of the dental school to run my behind up on the hill to be a part of whatever was going on because, you know, at heart, like that's where I still was. Like my friends were there. And so, um, I have, I have no regrets. I love it. You know, of course, anyone who's been to Howard, like you can chill in the undergrad environment forever. It's just, mm -hmm. it's like family, you know, but, um, but I made it work, you know, I made it work. I was able to, to maintain both and um, just grateful for that. So when you, when you graduate dental school, you're, you're 23. Yeah. And I know in your bio, that's, you, you put, that was the youngest, mm -hmm. per, was that, is that the youngest person to ever graduate from? At the, at the time I was, I believe, I, I don't know, I think a couple years later, someone did my same program and I think her birthday might have been July or mm -hmm. no, her, I, I was August. So I think her birthday was like after mine. So she might've been now the new youngest, but at the time they had never had someone so young complete their program. That's crazy. My, my boy, he's my, he's the best man at my wedding. He didn't mm -hmm. start dental school until he was like 28. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that, that, that get in the um I couldn't get in the clubs like my classmates were going to dream yeah and uh I like was trying to get like a fake ID or something because I, I couldn't get in and it was so funny because you know it, it's just now that I look back at it it's like I was a child I was like 19 years old you know um trying to like maintain but you know so you when you graduate at 23 I know like like, like all of those, you know, major, when you become a, a, uh, a doctor, mm -hmm. you got to take those boards still, mm -hmm. you know, how was it, you know, you're 23. So I know you, everybody, oh, why are you 23? You're a doctor, you know, um, you know, you got the world on a platter. Did you pass the boards on the, on the first go around? I did. Um, so oh, the, in dentistry, there's two, uh, there's a written boards that you take, and then there's a clinical hands-on. So, um, you know, God bless me with this gift of like, I have a photographic memory that's very short term. Okay. So there, there's a story to this, you know, I know that my, my classmates used to joke and they, 
would call me Doogie Hauser and stuff because I was so young in there. But I always say, I don't think I was ever that I was just so smart. It's just that I could, I could memorize like pictures, like I could memorize what I saw on a paper. And so I went in to take my boards and um, there were two versions, A and B. And I remember that after I took it, I literally go to my car and I just start writing everything I can remember, right? Like I, I jump in my car and write everything. And out of 200, out of 400 questions, I remembered 196. Um, of the really? Questions. Yeah, it was so crazy. I, I Even now, I don't know if I can still do it. So I write them down and I give them to my classmates who ever didn't take the boards yet. Um, and some people had my version and if they did, they like murdered it because I could remember 196. And if they didn't, then then they didn't. But I never scored like super high on it. I passed. But um, it, it, it's kind of funny that we're having these discussions about success. Because if you ask my classmates who I went to dental school with, and I, I think I attribute it a lot to the fact that I was still trying to hang out. I never was trying to do like be the top of my dental class. Like I literally was like, what do I need to do to pass this course? and get up out of dental school. Like I never was like, I need to be like, cause I was hanging out. So even for stuff like that. Um, and so my classmates were like, so thankful that, you know, I had, I had memorized these, these questions. Um, but I will tell you this about Howard and that, and what upsets me so much about when people discuss HBCUs, especially like medical school, dental school, there is this, um, stereotype that one, we only went to Howard because we couldn't get accepted somewhere else, like to a predominantly white institution, which is a lie because I was going to go to Columbia before I decided to go to Howard Dental. And two, that we are not rated as high because skill wise. Let me tell you this. And for anyone who is watching, Howard Dentist skills are so on point. I came out, I took my first hands on board, which covers like New York, Maryland, D.C. It's like 20 states called the nerve passed easily. Everyone said Florida and California are the two hardest and don't be alarmed if you don't pass the first time, blah, 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 blah. So I went down to Florida and I remember taking this course with other dental students. And I remember the professors just being in awe of me and one other girl who went to Howard's hand skills. And they were like, wow, like something about people who come out of Howard. And I realized that it has to do with our culture. And I know that sounds funny because you're like, what you mean culture? But you know how us black folk are. Like, we're not going to take you by the hand. It's like, go in there and do it. Like, you know what I mean? It's like people have been raised by even like a black mother. It's a different sense of like, do it. And I think that's what Howard did is like, we're not going to baby you. We're not going to coddle you. So we were put in a position where I just remember having like professors who I thought that they were so cool. And they were like, baby girl, like you need to go on in there and, and get that tooth out. I don't know what to tell you. And I'm like, but aren't you going to come in there? I'm going to be over here in the corner. Like, you know, do what you got to do. Nothing's going to, you know? And so it developed a sense of confidence in us. And um, I passed my Florida boards uh, the first, the first time. Wow. And so did uh, my classmate who we, we both took it, but that's all Howard. That is all Howard. None of me. Like, I can't even take credit and say it was me. That was Howard teaching. Welcome to the Go Fish Village podcast. As a Chinese proverb says, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. At Go Fish, our goal is to teach individuals just like you how to build wealth through real estate. Why don't we see more blacks in, in medicine? I think I was uh, uh. I had a, talking to a doctor the other day. And she was saying like less than five percent of uh, physicians are black, and when you and less than three percent of dentists are black. So we we just had you know with with the state of what's going on right now um, in the world, and you know racial bias is becoming such a big topic because racial bias exists in every single area of life, you know, mm -hmm. and um, there are only three percent of dentists in the country are black, so. And then for women, it's even lower because there's more, there's more male dentists. And I think that it's, it's several reasons. I mentor a lot of young uh, students who are at predominantly white institutions and they'll tell me they're, that are, they're black and they'll say, I'm the only black student in the class or I'm one of three in my class. So what I think some of these institutions want us to believe is that they didn't have enough qualified black people applying. 
but that's not always the case. I think that there is racial bias. So I think a lot of these universities, um, they, they do their intake process. And if race doesn't matter, then why do we have a box for race? We do. That's what it is. You go to an interview, you see my race. So I think that they accept their one or two or three, whatever their quota is that they want to fulfill. And they would rather give that spot to someone, um, who is not black. And it, it just goes back to a part of racial bias and it exists. It doesn't make sense that the, the majority, I'd say over 50% of all black dentists went to either Meharry or mm-hmm. Howard. Right. That makes sense. You know, you understand? It doesn't make sense. <laughs> right. Two schools out of like a thousand. <laughs> out of how many? And that's where they're coming out of. And you remember there was a time when we were not allowed to go to those universities. Hence why we have Howard and Hampton mm-hmm. And, you know, fam you. So um, I think that one, that's a problem is racial bias and even the accepting process Two, representation. I always say representation matters. And that's why this has been so big with me is that people need to see someone that looks like you for you to understand this could be you. So mm-hmm. growing up, most people's idea of the dentist is like an older white man. You know, mm-hmm. you don't see a black guy or a black woman and then try to add a little urban flair to it. You know, there's 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 somebody else I mentor. His name is Dr. Rose and he raps. It's so funny because he's a dentist and they call him like the rapping dentist. But it what is so big about someone like him, for example, is that there's young people who can look at him and relate. You understand? There's young people who can look at me and relate like, wow, if she can do this and she can be in this position, you know what I'm saying? It, it well, Look what having President Barack Obama did for young kids that were black. It was like, wow, I could actually be president mm-hmm. because the thought we were not growing up, we were never like made felt that this is possible. So I think that we have to change these numbers. Like we do need more black individuals in healthcare and in dentistry because the numbers of, let's take oral cancer, right? A black male is 30% more likely to die from oral cancer than a white male. So people are like, oh, well, it has to do with, you know, their other underlying health factors. Yeah, but it also has to do with the fact that most uh, dentists who are willing to work in underserved communities are black. You know, most white dentists are not willing to serve communities that are not their communities. So these things go undiagnosed or overlooked. So there's so much to it. And that's why I'm constantly pushing. I'm so excited when someone wants to be a dentist. And especially if they're of color, I'm always like, it's awesome career. Like, do it. We need more of you. Like, we need to show up and show out, you know? In our community, why are like certain foods legal? You can argue that a lot of these foods that have all this sodium in it Mm -hmm. and so much sugar in it are more harmful than a lot of things that require you to be 21 or 18 to consume and a lot of banned substances. But, you know, I remember when I was a teacher, like students would come to school, you know, eating Doritos in the morning, eating donuts in the morning. Mm -hmm. And it, obviously that's their choice. But at the same time, these are like the only food places that were in our communities. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, when you see stuff like that, is it, is it really just about the dollar about making money? I mean, cause when in my, in my community, you know, where I live at now, we have a whole foods here. We got a, we got a ton of grocery stores where I used to live. It was like one grocery store and it was like a mile away, you know? You know, this is, this is such a big and deep talk topic, honestly, because this, these underlying issues stem way, I'm talking way back slavery time. Think about even things like pork. Mm -hmm. You know, pork is one of the highest uh, cholesterol fat having animals of all. But back in the day, you know, you read history books, they basically left the worst parts of the pig for the slaves, right? So Mm -hmm. that's what, what they got used to eating because that's all they had the option to eat, which is very high in cholesterol, which you're more um, likely to have high blood pressure, some, you know, other issues. And over time, this became a cultural thing now. So it's like, okay, well you know, we, we're going to cook pork. And so 
it's so much bigger than, and that's why I, I, I hate when there's discussions about the racial bias and the, and the inequalities and people say, oh, well, slavery was such and such years ago or something was so, so long ago, but you don't understand how these things repeat and how you're so far behind on so many levels and how systemically and genetically you transfer these things from child to child to child, every, every new generation, it happens. And so we're slowly trying to reteach like, this is not these these types of foods are not good for you to eat and bigger than just the health disparities from us as a people as a race there's also a lot of issues with racism think about the mortality rate for women having babies a black woman is three to four times more likely to die during childbirth than her counterparts well, why is that? I remember posting that once and, you know, I have followers of, you know, social media that aren't black. And I think they took a little offense, like, well, what are you trying to say? And it's like, I'm not trying to say anything. I'm telling you, this is a fact. And that is part in due to not just because we're super unhealthy people, but because when a black woman says, I'm in pain, something doesn't feel right, I'm uncomfortable. She is looked at from society as she's an angry black woman, she's always complaining, they don't take what we're saying seriously, or if there is another person on the same floor as us who is experiencing some type of symptoms, we have always been made to feel less. So that woman's life is more important, her child's life is more important, and there's the whole, oh, these black women, they're constantly having babies, they're gonna put them on welfare. You could be an educated black woman in the hospital who can afford the delivery yourself, has nothing to do with Medicaid, but they see you as, as black, and it is a problem, and now they're bringing so much more light to it that this is an issue. This shouldn't be that much of a difference between giving birth as a black woman than a white woman. You know, not in 2020. This shouldn't be a problem like it is. Yeah, I mean, it's it's all it's all across the board. I remember, uh, you know, it's a recent thing that came out about uh, from Goldman Sachs. They did this study, but I just remember years ago there was a study that came out. It was like a black man with a college degree, you know, um, is less likely to get a job than a white man with a felony in the state of New York. I believe it. <laughs> and when you, you know, when you hear stuff like that, even in 2020, it's, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you know, I just feel like the, the, the Food and Drug Administration or whoever monitors, like, I don't know, health standards and community things, you know, it's okay to have that corner store in the neighborhood, but I think it should be like a ratio, like, okay, if income and educational neighborhood is below this level, it doesn't need to be mcdonald's on every single corner you know in that neighborhood because it is hard as a single parent it's easier to go to mcdonald's and spend five dollars on two happy meals to because i catch myself doing it you know yeah. when i got my kids i'm like damn i don't feel like cooking <laughs> you know what i mean but i know that that's going to be you know that's not what they're going to be doing every day so so yeah. yeah so going back you know i know you're from africa um your dad's from africa from egypt you know, I know Africa is a whole continent, but when you guys came over, was was there like a perception of like how African Americans are in America or like mm -hmm. HBCUs? What like were, were were we considered to be like less than or like lazy and not taking advantage of the opportunities that we had? What was it from your perspective? So it's funny you ask that because my husband and I. Um, you know, my husband is Nigerian American and um, we had this conversation actually just like a month ago and we were saying that a lot of foreign black people who come to this country that it's actually a little unfair because there is a judgment and I think there was even from my father which was when you don't know all the facts you understand all you see is what is what's wrong with you you live in America like, you have no idea the opportunities versus yeah like Egypt why are you not doing this why are you so quote-unquote lazy mm -hmm. there's this judgment that is given which is very unfair and I've had a lot of conversations with fellow um, immigrants who had this notion that well we come over here we bust our tail we do this we do this we do this and I don't understand why so many black Americans aren't doing whatever but there is even a level of racism um, against black Americans that is not the same for someone like me. You know, I'm still awarded a sense of like, 
oh, you're Egyptian, like, you know, like a little leeway, or even if you're Nigerian, because Nigerians have been known to come to this country and do phenomenal things, and they're doctors and lawyers, you know. But I think that um, growing up in our culture, there was a sense of, I don't want to, I don't want to use the word lazy, but there was a sense of, well, why aren't they taking advantage of the opportunities that they're American? You know, like we worked so hard to be American citizens or why are they not? And I think that it wasn't until I was properly educated on the history of the treatment of black people in this country that you really get it. And until you also feel and, and have ever been a, a victim of racism, it, you don't completely understand it. You don't understand that it's not that simple. It's not just, okay, you, you do this. If you, if your parents grew up in, in the projects and now you're in the projects and you're asking this child, like, why didn't you go on to go to med school? You know, it's not that simple. And I think there's even racial inequalities, you know, with skin tones. I mean, let's just be honest. I'm a dentist. Yes, I'm a black woman, but I also push that I'm a black woman all the time because I never, you know, there's this little line of gray area where you could pass for other, you might be something. And I'm always like, no, I'm black. And I make a point to say that because I know that there are some white clients who may give you a pass because you kind of are light, fair skinned and your hair might be a little different. And are you really black or are you mixed with something? Um, and so there's just so many layers to all of this. And um, that's why educating yourself on history is so important. Mm. And, and Howard is so good about that. Um, just making you understand, like really understand the essence of black people in this country. You're aware of the privilege that you have and yeah. you're using it to affect positive change. Where, where does that come from? Well, thank you for um, one for saying all of that. And it really makes me proud to know that um, that is what I'm reflecting because sometimes you don't know, you know, you, you, you have this mission and you, you're trying and you don't know how it's being perceived. But I think that the turning point for me was when I had a daughter. I think that, um, one, the average person doesn't even know um, that my husband played football for so long. I, don't I didn't know till I was like, uh, I was like a goalie. I was like, that sounds familiar. And I was yeah. like, I started like digging. I was like, Mm -hmm. this dude played for the bears, <laughs> you know? And the thing is, is I don't really mention it. I don't know if I've ever mentioned it ever on my, I mean, I say I'm married, but I've never said that he had such a successful career or, you know, where he's at in life now. Um, because I've just, I'm a big believer of for women to have their own sense of self mm -hmm. and success. And I do think that me having a, my first child was a daughter. I have a son too, but my first child was a daughter. And when you have a little girl, so much goes through your mind. And I've, I've said this before, my daughter is not going to do the things I tell her to do. She is going to do the things that she sees her mother doing. So from the time she's so young and she sees me get up, she sees me put on scrubs in the morning. She knows I'm going to work. She, um, she understands that you know, there was a joke because my, my husband um, was retired for so long before he, he now has a, a different position, but he was at home and he took her to school. He picked her up and my daughter would joke with people and say, you know, my mommy's a dentist. My daddy doesn't have a job. My daddy takes me to school. And it was kind of like an inside joke with us. But I think it was important for her to see her mother in such a position. You know, I took her to my office one time when we were doing one of our charity events. And this is, this is big because I actually took her because I wanted her to see giving back. I wanted her to see us doing free cleanings, free, free screenings on underserved communities and children. And that's why she was there. But this little girl is so brilliant. You know, she was only um, four and she, she walks around and she sees my office and she sees everyone calling me doctor and, you know, me making decisions. And she just kept saying, mommy, this is your office, mommy, you're the boss. And like, she said it so many times and it just, mm -hmm. it lit me up because it's like, she will go on life knowing that that's what she can do. That this is, this has nothing to do with her daddy. This is my mommy's office. Um, my mommy is the boss. They're calling my mommy doctor. And, um, I think that's a big part of my driving force is that I've always had um, 
this tenacity in me. But when I became a mother of a girl, it just it just fueled a fire that that said legacy. Were you were you always an entrepreneur? No. So I um I graduated and my older sister's a dentist. So okay. I, I naturally just um I decided to uh Got you. Join, join with her and I I was her associate. I worked for her actually. And um I was I was actually just telling this that it's so important the people you surround yourself with because at the time he wasn't my husband. He was uh, we were dating. Um I think we were seriously dating, but um I was working for my sister and I was pulling in great numbers and I never called out sick. I mean, I was like the model employee. And I remember him saying, you know, I remember bragging to him about all my numbers compared to the other doctors. And he was like, why haven't you asked for ownership? And when you say him, you mean? My husband. Okay. Okay. Dating at the time. And I was saying, that's why it's so important the the company you keep. And he just was like, well, why haven't you asked for ownership? (laughs) Um, and this is from my sister. And oh, I was, man, he calls him, calls him problems in the family. <laughs> it literally was just like, you know, and, and it was such a big lesson learned about knowing your worth. And he, and I was, and I felt like, and this actually happens too often with women, um, especially women of color, is that we almost are like, who am I to ask for more or to, to demand what I'm worth? And this was my own blood who loves me. And my sister has been a mentor to me, but I still had this sense of who am I? What's the, ask? what's the age difference between you and your sister? Nine, nine years. Okay. She's nine years older than me. Um, and she's God sent. I mean, Man, she, so that's, that's the, that's the student coming to the teacher. Like, yes. yo, <laughs> yes. so it was very, I was very nervous to have this talk. And I remember, you know, and, and my husband was telling me at the time, like I said, we were just dating. He just said, I'm not telling you to, you know, but why would she offer that to you? You would have to ask for that. Like, right. why would you, all she can say is no. And I remember thinking, he's like, but it makes sense. He's like, you have to be able to separate business, you know, your business self, because wow. I was so appreciative to her for giving me so much just in life. And, um, He's like, unless you always just want to work for someone, but if you don't and you want to be an owner. So I remember going to her and sitting her down and saying, you know, I do this. My, these are my numbers. Like I treated it like a, like she wasn't my sister, like my boss. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I never call out sick. I do this. I, I bring a lot to this company <clears throat> and I want to be part owner. And if, if you don't want that, I totally respect it, but I might need to consider starting my own practice, which is what I didn't want to say. I was so scared to say it. And, you know, she, she smiled and she was like, I'm really proud of you. Like I, I'm, I was waiting for this, you know, I was wondering when, you know, and she went, she said, I'm going to talk to my husband about it. And she came back to me like within a day and was like, you're so valuable. And if we lose you, we, you know, we lose a lot. And I would rather, I never wanted a business partner. That's what she told me. I never wanted a business partner, but I'm willing to, um, to do it with you, you know, to keep you. And I was like, Oh, thank God. And, you know, um, you know, and that, that, that story, but you, you know, closed mouths don't get fed and I don't care if it's family. I don't care if it's, and that's what I try to tell, um, some of these young professionals, whether you're a dentist or a doctor, whatever you're doing is like, you got to know your worth and you have to be confident in it. And you have to be able to understand that people are only going to respect you the way you respect yourself and the way you, you um, rate your own self. So if I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm the shit and I know you need me and whatever it is, you know, in that aspect, um, it's harder for someone else to see that in you. If you're constantly like downplaying what you can bring to the table. So when you approach your sister, I know you had the data to support that, Hey, I should be, I want equity in this business. I should be a partner in this business. Was there, because the uncomfortable part becomes, all right, now we got to create like paperwork and agreements and this is how things get settled. Did did you guys do that? Was um, Or was it just like a handshake? No, no, no. Um, I think too, when you're in, um, whether you're in the medical field or you're a business major, I think that if you have a business mindset, then and this is, this is actually a sign for people. If, if, 
If you have a real business mindset, then one, you understand that everything has to be documented, legal. This is not no, like this is not personal. It's completely separate. So we went through the proper channels, whether that was appraising what the business is worth, looking at the numbers, figuring out what I would need to contribute to buy in. Um, everything was, it was not, this is not like I'm doing you a favor as a big sister. It was like, this is what it is. And we negotiated, um, you know, a, a percentage and everything was, was legit. And after everything was signed, we really never looked back moving mm. forward. So the, so you guys did have to do, you know, take care of black and white and get signatures. Yes. So I think it goes to the point where like, you, you kind of like, if you stay ready, you know, um, you don't have to get ready. So I'm mm -hmm. sure when it was time to buy in, you know, you had the money, you know, when it was time to negotiate, you were able to say, hey, look, this is what I brought to the table in terms of marketing and visibility and, you know, understanding what the business is worth. Yeah. So that's, that's dope, man. It's, it's dope that you get to do that with your sister, somebody that, that wants the best for you. And I think it's also cool that she was open to it because a lot of people, you know, sometimes pride can kill things, you know, yeah. you know, being that, you know, she might look at you as the, as, you know, I changed your diaper. What do you know about business right. you know what i'm saying you know i built this from the ground up you didn't do this but you know i'm sure she probably looks back on it like man okay less work i can focus more on the things that i'm good at and hand off other things uh to you so that's that's dope so how long have you all been in business hmm. gosh it's been a while now um you think i would know that exact date it's got to be like eight or nine years now oh really okay okay so yeah. how did you and at what point so now you you seriously so you obviously you were serious um with your now husband when when what year did you guys get married uh we got married in 2014 so we've been okay. married six years. so 2014 um you get married so things are kind of shaping so now you know you're in business for yourself you're an entrepreneur um and when did you have your first child in 2015 <laughs> to 2015. No, I could certainly understand. I mean, I remember me and my wife and I say this story a lot. We got, I opened up my business October 1st, 2012. We got married November 17th, 2012. And I remember leaving our wedding and going right to the ATM to deposit all of the money that we had gotten for, um, wow. like as gifts to yeah. make payroll. That's how messed up <laughs> I was at the time. And like, like the whole concept of owing money back to the IRS and, mm -hmm. and still feeling like you hadn't made any. Yeah. I had to learn that, you know, the hard way. I remember inviting people to my wedding like, yo, if I invite them, maybe I can make more money. Like it was a part of my <laughs> business plan. <laughs> it, was, it was just backwards. Uh, uh, but, that's so I, <laughs> it was a backwards, backwards it, thing. Struggle, but you know, I, I feel like, um, you know, sometimes people are like, you know, what, what do you do not to fail? And what do you recommend not doing fail? And I'm always like, failure is a part of success. Like you cannot, some of the most successful people in the world, like success is built on um, failures, frustration, downfalls, because that's the only way we learn and we grow. Um, and mm -hmm. it builds a character in you you know and that's why so many of these um and there's no judgment here but i'm just saying you hear so many stories of these hedge fund children or you know kids that grew up with all this money and why they end up you know in these terrible situations because there is something to be said about people who have had to struggle and who have failed several times um so that you learn from those mistakes you know so yeah so what about you know in your industry you know um because it's one thing to have a skill, you know, mm -hmm. like you have a skill, you obviously solve a problem, but right. it's another thing to marry that with business, you know what I mean? And being able to, to grow it so that you can kind of concentrate more on working on the business and not necessarily like in the business. Mm -hmm. Where did your business savvy come from? 
Yeah, um, I think you're hitting on such a valuable point, and I think that it's important for individuals to recognize where they excel because some of the best dentists that you know I know, I mean, phenomenal skills, but terrible business people. You know, mm -hmm. some of my own friends and colleagues, and it's like I want to tell them, like, you know, you need to just either have a partner, like I said, you need one who excels at something better than you, because I do believe that being an entrepreneur is not for everyone. And sometimes mm -hmm. we push it so much where we're like, oh, you need to have your own, you have your own. And it's not for everyone. And, and that doesn't mean you're any less of a person. It's just that there's a certain person for it. And I think if you're an entrepreneur, you get it. And people who are, are, business owners and who are successful business owners and who enjoy it, you literally think about your business all the time. There's not one day that goes by in my life that my brand, my, my business, my company doesn't cross my mind. I get messages from staff members. I, I think about payroll. I think about, mm -hmm. you know, reviews on the weekends. I'm looking up our Google reviews, seeing what did someone say anything bad and how we can improve. It is a, a, the type of person who, who is an entrepreneur generally is, people who are very restless, their minds are always going mm. about the next thing. And, you know, I have friends who are completely opposite. They love working for the company they work for. They clock in, they clock out. They're phenomenal at what they do. They have no desire to know the inner workings of that company and they don't want to want to reach that. And I think it is very imperative to define if you are that person or not and to accept it because you cannot force anything, you know, like me, I don't, I could never, I don't think I could be comfortable just being an, an associate for somebody because I'm not built that way. In my mind, I would be thinking for them, like, we need to be doing this in the waiting area. We need to be doing that. Even decisions um, for COVID, how we are operating now. As an owner, I, my sister and I make all the rules. The patient waits in the car, they don't, the temperature reads. So as an associate, I would feel like I, I need to control more than I'm, I'm controlling. And so I think that you really have to, um, to understand that business is not for everyone and that's okay. And I think people underestimate the level of work, of stress, mm -hmm. um, dedication, of time uh, that is given to own a flourishing business. What, what was the hardest transition? You know, when you go from, hey, be here at, because I, I, you know, I got friends that are dentists, they get paid, they got like a minimum they'll make a day or they get like a certain yeah. percentage of the work that they'll do. But at the end of the day, they're working from this time mm -hmm. to this time, you know, and they got an element of guaranteed money. You know, for you, what was the biggest transition uh -huh. from going to, an associate, which is still an amazing career, but now you have a different hat, which is entrepreneur. Like I was listening to a quote, I forgot what it was, and it was saying as um, it was saying like when you work for somebody, you worry about which job am I gonna have a job today, and when you're an entrepreneur, it's like which job am I gonna do today? You know, That's for you, what was the biggest transition? I think for me, the biggest transition was understanding the level of responsibility I had over so many people's lives. What I mean by that is when you're an associate, you're like, okay, if something don't work out right, I'm pretty much the only person affected. But when you own a business, um, hmm. I have to worry about at least 50 people because it's them, their spouses, their children. If my company fails, I'm failing them too because they have put their trust in my company, their loyalty in my company. So every decision that we're making, it's a lot of um, load, it's a lot of stress. So even during this pandemic, you know, my staff might not know the level of stress I had trying to figure out how to get the proper, you know, funding so that they did not have a job. You know, there's yeah. so much more to it where I thought about how are they eating? like. You know, and this was, we, we privately told our, our office manager to contact every staff member and to make sure they didn't have to say who they were, but if they were in a need where they were not able to eat or buy food or pay for something imperative to let our office manager know, and we would provide them with funds. That level of thinking is not something you do when you're just an associate, but when you own a company, you, you constantly have so much you're worried about, um, 
you know, the payroll, someone wants to sue you because they slipped and fell down the stairs of your building. I mean, there's so much to it. And I think that's why um, one of our associates used to own his dental office for years. And um, when we met him, he was like, I'm just, I, I'm tired. I want to show up. I want to do dentistry and I want to go home. You know, I got a text um, an hour before we started this from one of my employees saying that, you know, um, she's feeling a little under the weather and she doesn't have a fever or anything, but she's feeling under the weather. And so we have to make a decision at that moment. I, my phone is always on, doesn't matter what hour of the day because anything could happen. How do you, how did you go about building a, a, a team? So um, when I talked about excelling, my, my sister, that's, she's really good at reading people. Um, most of our interviews, we, they, they go through her first. She kind of weeds out people she doesn't think is a good fit. After she decides that she thinks they are, they do like a working interview with me. Um, and, um, you know, I always say we're so blessed with our, our staff. I mean, these are some of the most amazing people, um, not just their work ethic, but just humans. And um, I know a lot of times you hear business advice that you shouldn't get too emotional and, you, you know, it's business is business and stuff. But I think what's made our company such a success is because we are emotionally involved with our employees. They're like family. We love them. Um, my um, head assistant has been with us for over 10 years. So she was working with my sister before I even um, joined on and, and she's still there. And it's because we, we appreciate them. We love them. We show them our appreciation. We know that we couldn't be where we're at, um, especially as minority women um, without them. Hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. So now you have this amazing title um celebrity dentist mm. which is i was trying to figure out that title you know it's so funny you say this because you know we're you know we're family here this is open communication when my when my husband and i got married uh it was like all over the blogs and i remember it saying retired nfl player at a marries celebrity dentist you know dr amira and I was like, and this is so funny because me and my husband are, are sitting there. I think we're on our honeymoon when, we, when people were sending us this. And I said, but here's the question. <laughs> are you a celebrity dentist because you're the celebrity or am I celebrity dentist because I see celebs? And so we laughed at it. It was like became a joke because my husband was like, you know, clowning me like, what? what they're giving you a title, you know, out here. Um, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, nonetheless, I still don't know what it means. I think it means I see celebrity clients is what I'm going to go with. What does that mean to be a celebrity dentist? And not only that, like they're actively endorsing your work. You know, it's not like you're just, you know, taking a picture on a low of them coming in your office. Like they're actively coming back to your business, sending you referrals. And, you know, mm -hmm. is, is there a level of pressure that you feel sometimes? You know, uh, when I first started, I think, um, I think I was nervous the first time um, I was going to work on, on LeBron. And I remember feeling like, Oh God, you know, because it was like, I wanted to make sure I did a great job because, you know, one, I still had that business mindset. Like I want him to refer people, but I just felt like I wanted to make sure I wasn't, you know, I was doing the right thing. And um, I'll tell you this about a lot of the celebs I work with. When I tell you these people are so kind and down to earth and, and, and some of the people that actually work for them, their assistants and their staff, they're actually generally not as kind as the actual person. And, you know, LeBron walked in and I did feel like a little bit of, you know, and I never showed it, or at least I didn't think so. It was very professional. Mm -hmm. um, but something happens when they sit in my chair. It's like, you are no different to me than anybody else because all I see is what this is like. My damn, your teeth fucked up too. Like everybody <laughs> else's. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's like, you know what? And um, I think that once I started making a, a big impact on their, whether they're in a lot of pain and they have to come to me, whether they need their teeth straight fast for an, uh, 
you know, a new commercial they're shooting. I think that the same way we look at them with this sense of like, wow, you're so dope because you do this and that. They actually gave that to me, which was kind of like amazing. Cause I was mm -hmm. like, you know, um, take Dwayne Wade and I can talk about this openly cause he did, you know, he posted it on his page. But when Dwayne Wade came to me, it was basically like, you got three months to straighten these bottom teeth because I got such and such commercials and that's all you got. And I'm like, hold up, what? You know, like it was like unheard of what they, his team was asking. And I was like, well, I'm going to do the best that I can. And he literally posted a picture of his teeth when they were like crowded and whatever. And was Damn. like, three months ago, you know, like you think he said something like my, my teeth were playing peekaboo with each other. And now they're <laughs> like perfectly straight and we did it in time. And I think he was, um, so thankful, you know, just for the level of, um, you know, professionalism and that we got it done. So I do, um, I do know that people seem, seem to wonder about, about a pressure, especially working with a certain clientele, but I'm going to say this and I know people think it's hard to believe, but I treat whether I'm, uh, whether I'm getting, putting veneers on, you know, a Michael Jackson, and I know people are going to be hard to believe this, or if I'm putting veneers on my next door neighbor, to me, once I'm in that zone, like, it doesn't matter. Like, they have to be a level of perfection, because that is who I am. And it doesn't matter who I'm working on. Um, my name is on that work. And I think that people can, can see that in me. I think that my clients that come in, um, who know we see celebs, uh, they see the way I treat them and they've said it before. Like, like maybe they thought I wasn't going to treat them the same or, or there was a difference, but there isn't because I, I have a passion for this. I love what I do. I love people. I love loving on people. And, um, and so as far as the pressure goes, it, it, I feel no different. I'm nervous sometimes if I'm delivering a case on anybody, it doesn't matter who they are. I have a sense of like, Oh, this has to be right. It has to be, it has to be perfect. How did you go about growing, you know, that piece of the business? Because that, obviously that's very niche yeah. clientele. How did you go about growing it? You know, tr the truth is, and, I, and I've, I've tried to have these talks with, um, with, with people who, who always say, oh, I want to get my foot in the door and this and that. And I say, you know, uh, it's one of my favorite quotes, which is nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And that includes these type of people. So, you know, you have one of these clientele who, who calls you and if you, you, you don't care about them as a person and you treat them like, oh my God, uh, they come in, they, you, you're forcing them to take a picture. God forbid they're, they're in pain or something. Like you, you, you don't treat, these are real people. You know what I'm saying? Like the word celeb even can get so, like these are real people. And I think that I developed a rapport with them because I treated them as what they were, which was real individuals. And I did really care. And so you don't, you know, these people don't want to be treated like a famous basketball player when they're at their dental office, you know, they want to just be treated like regular, regular people. And so uh, all of my business has been through referral. I want to have an appointment with Dr. A in 2012. I probably could walk in maybe 48 hours, 72 hours. I probably could see you. If I want to get an appointment now with Dr. A, What's the turnaround on that? I want Dr. A. Nobody else. I want Dr. A because I, I I've been following. What's the turnaround time on something like that? You know, to be honest, you'd be surprised. Sometimes it's a wait, um, but sometimes we have cancellations and you might you might get in. It's, it's the luck of the draw. Like, you know, they send me my schedule on Friday and on I, when I saw it the week prior, it was like slam packs. And then I saw it and I had like three openings. So if you happen to call on Friday, they would be like, Oh, you could see her Monday, but then you might, somebody else might be like, she doesn't have anything for, for weeks. Um, so, and I'm working a lot less days in the office, which makes it a little more challenging. I've, I've decided to take um, some time away from, from so many clientele to just kind of work on other parts of the business and the brand. Um, so that plays plays a part in it. But you know, for you, you're different. You know, you're like VIP. We're gonna get you in ASAP. What is it like to have? Because I'm in a business where I'm constantly chasing business. No matter how much I sell, mm -hmm. I got to get more. You mm -hmm. know, to effectively like hit my goal and get my bonus and all of that. Right. What is it like to have a skill set that's so in demand where you like, damn, I need 
family time. I need travel time. I need time to work out. Mm -hmm. And the business is still almost to what to the point where the more you say no at this point, the more people kind of like that supply and demand type of effect. Like, what is it like to go from starting out? I got to prove myself to like, okay, now I'm on the other end and I'm so dope. My fingers is just so, I'm so nice with it. You know what I'm saying? That I got to turn business away because I got a, I got a husband. I got kids. I got myself. I, I've also developed I, I, speaking engagements. You know, uh, you know, what is that like? You know, people used to always talk about like, oh, having it all and this and that. And I used to say, there's no such thing as having it all, or at least not all at the same time. And that's just real talk. You can have it all in terms of you can be married, you can be a mom, you could have fitness, you could have family trips. It's just you have to understand that at every point in in your decision making, something will suffer. Mm -hmm. So, and you have to be okay with that. So there was a time when I couldn't work out the way I work out now because I just had to make a choice and that was on the back burner. So it was like fitness is gonna have to hold. Um, there was a time when, you know, my daughter had her very first, uh, Christmas recital and I had this huge case and the patient was flying in from out of state and there was no way I could cancel, move it. Like I made a responsibility and my husband was like, so I'm going to go. I'm like, yeah, like, you know, and you're going to have to go. <laughs> and you know, my husband's six, five, big football player looking guy and he's there cheering and you know jumping around and recording her and he was like one of like two dads there um but it was a decision i had to make and at that time i did choose my career um over that recital but there's times when it's the opposite you know someone is requesting one day they're in town they must see me that day and i have a, a family trip planned and i'm not moving it you know so you have to be willing to understand that um there's just going to be times where something's going to take it out welcome to the go fish village podcast as a chinese proverb says give a man a fish and you feed him for a day teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime at go fish our goal is to teach individuals just like you how to build wealth through real estate what do you say to women or just people period especially black women um we hear all these things oh man you can't be successful women and a woman mm -hmm. and get a black man you know or you have to you're gonna have to date down or if you focused on your career you're going to be single forever. Um, yeah. Uh, where do these, what do you think these stereotypes come from? And why do you think you've been able to be successful and not, I guess, fall victim to, to what I guess is portrayed in media? Um, I think what's portrayed in media is not completely off. And that I think a lot of career women, um, a lot of times they're still single, they're not married, they haven't had kids because yes, they have devoted um, so much of their efforts, their time into their career. So if you're really um, just working so hard on your career and you're not potentially out where you can meet someone, it happens. Um, I do believe that also having the right person so i was blessed you know when i met my husband um my husband is is educated he's intelligent he's motivating he um he's never looked at any of my success and uh, allowed it to make him feel less than he's actually only um encouraged and bettered me in every way possible with my career and i think that it's it's just about prayer and timing you know and having to understand that the right uh, person will accept you. You know, some people are like, oh, these women, they're too strong and they're too this and they're too that. You know, yes, I'm very strong in my career and I'm very strong as a woman. But when it comes to my household, like my husband is the leader of my home. You know, I've always said that he is the head and um, he covers our family. So that stereotype that women can't, you know, that's not true. You know, if anyone who's around us and close to us knows, like, you know, my husband leads our family thank and thankful for that. You know, he's a great leader. Um, so I do think that there's this negative, uh, 
you know, stereotype of black women who are in careers that they're just too strong. And we, we've had to be strong, to be honest. We've had to fight not only um, discrimination for race, but we've also had to fight to be paid, you know, what we're worth because we're women, you know, to, um, to hold positions that they thought that we couldn't hold. So yes, we do have that fire in us. Um, but I don't, some of the most successful friends that I have that are women that are, you know, grinding or at the top of their career, like at home, like they're completely different. So I just think that, um, you know, it's just a matter of like really not settling and, and waiting for that right person and um, understanding it. Like no one is perfect, you know, like, you know, everyone has their stuff, you know, us, me, my husband, you know, whoever, like nothing is going to be ideal. I have, I have a friend and I'm always like, girl, you won't be single forever because you just will find anything. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I don't like shirts he wears and I'm like, girl, you know? So, um, so yeah, just seeing a bigger picture. So what, where do you guys find balance? You know, um, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that, you know, I see in, in, by no means do I know the ins and outs of your marriage, but just knowing um, from what I've read about you and then seeing that your husband still, he's still like head of sports for like an, an agency. Is that right? You know, he's a lot. I'll oh, go ahead. He's the head of uh, sports and entertainment at UBS bank. He, right, um, UBS bank, which is a very prominent, you know, organization. Um, a lot of people would have hung it up. Hey, I'm retired. You know, I can just ride into the sunset. I mean, you, you've been very intentional. It seems like you both have been very intentional about being active, being active in the community. Um, you know, what do you all do for balance when it comes to, you know, like being behind the curtain? Yeah. So I think that uh, what you just said, those are things that kind of drew us together. We're both very ambitious, hardworking people. Our birthdays are actually five days apart. Um, we're both, we're both Leos and people say Leos are lions. When's their birthday? Mine's August 4th and his is August 9th. Okay. And I'm a Leo. I'm July 23rd. So. Okay. Yeah. So oh, yeah, we coming. Yeah. So basically, um, we both have that same drive. And so, you know, which after he retired, same thing, he wasn't, he, he wasn't a complacent enough person to just chill. He wanted to do more and he wanted to make an impact, which is where, you know, we make a difference. Um, and um, I think that where we've been able to create some sense of normalcy is that we, every year we take a trip, a trip. we go on this group trip with our closest friends. Um, sometimes it's like 20 of us. Um, one year we went to um, Portugal, another year Spain, Jamaica, and we literally, we shut it off when we're there. Like, you know, we do five, six days and we have a great time and it's not business. It's not what we're working on. And we really enjoy our, our friendship. Um, we have, we, we enjoy our marriage during these times. So that's important to us. Um, same thing with, um, you know, our anniversary every year, same idea. We try to get out of here, phones away, you know, we make that a point. And I think another thing that's really worked for us is that, um, and it's taken years because, you know, I've known him now like 10, over 10 years, but um, we have a good understanding of like who we are. And so, you know, when, when I first was really going hard with my career, he was retired and it worked out because he was more, you know, home chilling. And he, he actually gave me space to grind and to grow. And he understood that. And now it's kind of like role, role reversal in that now he has this huge position and he's grinding and he's working and he's not necessarily, and I've given him space to where I'm like, do you, I get it. Like you're building something right now. And so, um, that's where I feel like we've been able to find some sense of, of balance. That's dope. So now, um, you're getting awards. I mean, these are some amazing awards. America's top dentist, you know, you're getting recognition. Mm -hmm. Um, and you have an a list clientele, of course, any clientele is a list, but you know, you have some very powerful people that are trusting you with a grill, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, what does that mean for you to still be, you know, still young. And when you go to like, let's say dental conferences and you're on a, on, panels with people probably twice your age mm -hmm. and you're having the success that you know a dentist could probably live two or three lifetimes and still not have you know that type of level of 
success. You know, what does that mean when you're able to pour into, when you have people that are asking you for advice and they're older than you and people that are little girls coming up to you asking you for questions like at the mom I know you were the keynote speaker uh, for that. How does that feel to be like a, um, you know, looked up to in that regard and how to respect your peers? You know, it, it's amazing how with the more um, success you attain, life tells you that it's supposed to make you like, I guess, more arrogant or whatever. But it seems like I've just become more and more humbled by it because it's like you, you sit back and you think like, how did this happen? You know, uh, this this young girl from Egypt, this immigrant, like poor, like you you literally thank God, you know, I get, I get emails sometimes and I know some people are DMs and they probably think that I don't, I might not see it or I don't read it. And there's times where it like lights me up and it's like so much bigger than I could sell a $30,000 case in the office. And it's not the same feeling as when a young girl says, I sat in your chair years ago. I don't know if you'll remember me, but I was a mess in Miami. I was partying and you sat down and you, you talked to me for like 20 minutes. And she said, I remember thinking, doesn't she have like patience to see, but she's like, it was so important for you to mm. like talk to me about life and about how I need to wow. change the way I was moving. And she goes on to say um, that she wanted to tell me that she's currently in dental school. And that really just, um, you know, it just like was so fulfilling to hear. And so anytime I'm recognized, you know, whether it's an award, whether um, I'm asked for advice, I'm so humbled and I'm so appreciative of the position I'm in. I'm just so thankful that anyone even cares enough about me to want to highlight me or to want to ask for my advice. You know, it, it makes my heart smile on, on just another level. And it really just motivates me to like, keep going and keeps telling me like, you know what, God is telling you, like, you're doing the right thing. Like you're, you're making a difference in some way. And so, yeah, it's just, it's grateful. There's no other word for it other than grateful. Advice. Um, what advice do you have for the 18 year old this coming to Howard, you know, uh, parents is on the ass <laughs> like, yo, Boom, boom, boom. You know, you, you want to kick it. You want to have a great time. You want to be great afterwards. What advice do you have for that person? So my advice is this. Um, yes, you know, you should have a good time. You should have fun. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but you need, you need to, to pay attention to the people around you. You know, we, we talked about this earlier. You know, you, you, your network is your net worth. And what I mean by that is look at the people around you that you surround yourself with. You look at five, five closest people to you and you are an average of those people. So are you amongst people who are dreaming big, who are black excellence, who are grinding? You know, my father used to tell me like, you can't be the smartest person in your crew. You can't be the most experienced in your crew. You have to be around people who are going to make you better. And I had that at Howard. I was around some of the most brilliant people and I allowed that to encourage me. And my advice would be that you got to work hard now because most of the people that are chilling right now and, and, and doing this, those are the same people that as hard as you're working now, that's going to be a life you live that they probably will never live. Mm. You know, the comfortability to move the way you're going to move because you worked so hard. You can't, you can't cheat the grind. There's no way around it. You've got to grind and you've got to work. But I constantly tell people it is going to be worth it. It is going to be worth it. I am living proof, you know, and it's not about, I can't emphasize this enough. It's not about the cars you buy or the bags or the shoes you talked about. The biggest blessing to being in a position that I would consider myself in today is to wake up every day and do what you want to do, not what you're forced to do. But the number number one thing I always say is not having the stress of worrying, how am I going to pay my next bill, my car, my mm. house, food? These are things that I no longer worry about 
which I did at one time, that is the biggest blessing that has been offered to me by my hard work is that I don't have to worry about my kids eating. I don't have to worry about not having, you know, warmth during a winter or, or air condition. And it seems so simple, but you don't understand the struggles that people have. And so my advice is just to grind now so that you can shine later, mm. you know, grind now, shine later. That's real. Yeah. I I, I love this quote by Dave Ramsey. He says, uh, if you want something you've never had, you'll have to do something you've never done. Um, he's a financial guru, but, uh, but yeah, a hundred percent, man, more bars, man. So I know you're a keynote speaker, you know, that's another, uh, talent that you have, uh, which, um, you know, if, so if people want to kind of, you know, get in touch with you or mm -hmm. maybe book you for an event or just follow you, how would they, how would they do that? So um, everything is really, um, I have a website, it's dramira.com, D-O-C-T-O-R, and then my first name, amira.com. That's also, you'll find on my social media, my Instagram is Dr. Amira Ogunleye. Um, and we just actually launched a new website, which is so perfect for what you said. There's a section on there if you're looking for mentorship. There's a section for speaking engagements. There's a section for dentistry, wellness. I mean, it's all around um, everything that I am and what I believe in. And, um, and that's just the best way to, to get in touch with me. Okay. Uh, so last question. Um, legacy. You know, mm -hmm. 50 hundred years from now, what are we saying about, about Dr. A? I pray, I pray that my, my legacy is that, um, this woman came, she broke grass, glass ceilings. Um, she achieved, you know, all of the success, but why we remember her is the amount of impact and influence she had on the success of other women. Um, I, I don't want to be remembered for whatever I achieved. I want to be remembered for the amount of people that I instilled a fire in them to achieve and to break barriers and to make a difference and change the ratios of things. I want to be remembered for, um, for pouring into people and for caring. Awesome. So we got a few, we got a little Howard Jeopardy. See what you know about Howard University. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> we got I'm a little bit of Howard Jeopardy. I told you I took 21 credit hours a semester. This is not fair. Nah, you're good. You got to get a 3.8. So I know you know all this stuff by heart. So Yeah, right. So, all right. So first question. I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed. Real, real easy one. Real okay. easy one. What year was Howard founded? 1867. Boom, boom. What is the Howard motto? Ah, oh, crap. Howard motto? It's the not Howard black, motto. It's not black excellence? <laughs> that would be great. It should be black excellence. It that should, should be. be the motto. It should be. Let's change. Yeah, we, let's let's do that. I think if you make a donation, a sizable donation, we probably can get that changed. Um it's truth and service. What is uh, truth and service? Yeah, you know, what is the largest What's the name of the body of water that's closest to Howard? Hmm. Let me look at my geography real quick. Okay. What's that spot we used to kick it at on the water where we used to have those, those bomb drinks over there by Georgetown? This is a big water over there. Um, was that the Potomac? No. It's tricking me. It's tricking me. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That's a, where's the buzzer? You need the little buzzer, like. Eh. And um, this was a trick question. So that reservoir <laughs> that's right behind the football stadium. What? Um, yeah, trick question. That was a trick spell, question. Spell Crampton. C R A M P T O N. It's no P in Crampton. No P. What? No P in Crampton. No P. Come on. How many people got that wrong? Probably 80% of everybody gets that wrong. Um, in it? I should People know. get it wrong. Are you sure there's no P in Crampton? I'm about to Google. No P. I was surprised myself. And okay. I, worked, I worked in Crampton when I was a student. I was an usher. Dang, Crampton. Um, I was finish this sentence. Reared against the eastern sky. 
You're making me look bad. We're going to edit. Try to edit. <laughs> um, Probably there on Hilltop High. I, dang it. If it was multiple choice, I would have got it. You didn't give me a second, man. <laughs> if it was multiple choice. <laughs> <laughs> um, who was Howard named after? Mm. Mm. No. General no. Oliver Otis Howard. Okay. Um, it's white, right? He's white. Yep. I knew that at least. <laughs> uh, who's the president of Howard? Right now? Yep. Mm. I forgot. And I, that's the one that put out that letter. It was stressing me out. That letter. The, the All Lives Matter letter? No, no. He corrected the letter. But, oh, he did? Um, he, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that was like the head of the med school or something like that. that oh, okay. It was a med school. Okay, yeah. 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 No, I don't know. But Dr. Wayne Frederick, who did go to Howard Med School, I believe. Um, Is it president, current president? Yeah, current president. Mm -hmm. What is the name of the Black National Anthem? What is the name of it? The name of it. <sighs> this is bad. This is so bad. Sean didn't, Sean didn't prepare me for this. He don't get in trouble. Hey, Sean, my bad, bro. Sean is like, come on, Sean. <laughs> Wait till I this. Oh, man. Oh, don't tell me. I see your eyes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I know the come on, man. Oh man, I'm trying to cheat, but I'm not gonna be a cheater. Lift. Every voice. Yes, yes, there you go. All right, rapid fire. So rapid fire, you just give a response. One word answer, whatever comes to your mind first. You just roll with it. All right. All right. Who you know or what you know? Both. U Street or Adams Morgan? U Street. Homecoming better as an alum or as a student? Oh, student. Worst advice you ever got? Oh, worst advice I ever got. Ah, to try to fit in. You know, don't do too much. Don't be too black, you know, in your little area. Best Howard moment? Hmm. Probably freshman homecoming. The world is not black. Why would you go to an HBCU? Cause man, it's nothing like being around your people, being around that much excellence. I love me some us. That's why. <laughs> Howard men don't cheat. Fact. I'm False. helping you out. I'm helping you out here. Um, that is not true. I'm not falling for it. All men cheat. <laughs> Jordan or LeBron? Jordan, duh. Okay. Oh, well, I'm surprised. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, I know it's like lying. Sorry. <laughs> um, biggest Howard regret? I don't think I have any, honestly. When did you find your voice? Mm, probably just four years ago, sadly. When did you realize you were the shit? Mm. I think when my husband kept telling me it over and over again. If you weren't a dentist, what would you be? A plastic surgeon. Um, you got to start one, cut one, or bench one. Start one, cut one, bench one. Got it. Um, freshman orientation. Homecoming, graduation. Oh, that's hard. Okay, orientation got to get cut. And then the bench one, I uh, got to bench homecoming. I mean, you got to, I mean, graduation is, you know, it's graduation. Well, Dr. A, you've been a great guest today. Thank you. <laughs> so much thank you so much for having me man and now you're gonna make me go get a whole like howard history book because i cannot rep howard this hard and not know some of those simple uh trivia <laughs> you'll learn it again once all uh, your kids start looking at colleges you'll be like there did you, you did you know <laughs> did you <laughs> right ah, there you go you know cool all cool. right well, thank you again for coming on Sunday, i appreciate all it right. Thank you for joining the HU Movemaker podcast, where we highlight folks that have contributed to the Howard legacy at the highest levels. 
To hear more interviews or purchase merchandise, please visit www.humovemakers.com.